to introduce to you Matthias Kunzel, who's come here from Hamburg in Germany. Um, Matthias, as some of you obviously know, has written prolifically on the issues of Islamicism, of Islam extreme, extremism and anti-Semitism. Matthias has a, his PhD from, from, Hamburg, from, uh, from Hamburg, and he has a position at the Technical College in Germany, in Hamburg. Um, he's, he's written prolifically on issues of Iran, Islamism, and Hezbollah. Um, his recent book is entitled Jihad and Jew Hatred about the new Jewish anti-Semitism. And we're honored to have you here today. And I, just as a point, uh, Professor Dory Lau was here, and I think in 2003 you were the keynote speaker at a uh, session that you organized. And I think there's a lot of controversy. So maybe today it's a good sign that you're dealing with similar issues and there's not so much controversy. And I think people realize that this is a very important issue that warrants our attention and serious scholarly, scholarly debate and analysis. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Charles. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me here to speak at this outstanding lecture series. This is a great pleasure for me to be here, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present to you today and discuss one of the most explosive issues of the day. Look at this Thursday's new headlines. President Bush is discussing with Iraqi Prime Minister al-Maliki about Iran. Condi Rice is meeting with Palestinian President Ahmed Abbas. And the main topic will be Hamas. And even my fellow German, who happens to be the Pope, is conducting discussions <laughs> on radical Islam right now in Ankara. Each of these events is in one way or another related to our very topic today. And now down business. Nobody here will have forgotten the horrors of the most recent Middle East war, which took place this summer. But who still remembers the hopes of the previous summer, in 2005, when Israel, despite massive internal resistance, pulled all its troops and settlers out of Gaza? Back then, Many people hoped that the Gaza Strip would develop into a modern Palestinian region that could form the nucleus of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. But what happened was the opposite. Almost immediately, this territory was transformed into an outpost in a war against Israel as new weapon dumps and arms factories sprang up everywhere. From Gaza, Islamists bombarded the Jewish state with hundreds of Qassam Messiahs. Why? It was the same story in southern Lebanon. Following the withdrawal of the Israeli army in 2000, it was turned into a deployment area. Hezbollah installed over 12,000 rockets supplied by Iran via Syria near the Israeli border. The area was turned into a base for aggression with a well-planned system of fortified positions and network of tunnels from which on 12 July 2006, an attack was launched on Israeli troops. Why? In both Gaza and Lebanon, the possibility existed for a normalization of relations with Israel, leading in all probability to an economic upturn. So why did Hezbollah and Hamas prioritize weapons and war rather than peace and welfare? Why are they spurred on in doing so by Iran, a country that had neither a territorial dispute with Israel nor a Palestinian refugee program? This is the answer given by Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, quote, Israel is a cancer in the region, and when a tumor is discovered, it must be cut out. <coughs> and here is what Khaled Mashal, leader of Hamas, said, quote, before Israel dies, it must be humiliated and degraded. We will make them lose their eyesight. We will make them lose their brains. While Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the Iranian president, promises that, quote, very soon this stain of disgrace will be purged from the center of the Islamic world, and this is attainable. 
My final example of this kind of statement comes from Mohammed Hassan Rahimian, the representative of the Iranian Supreme Leader, who stands even higher in the Iranian hierarchy than Ahmadinejad. Just two weeks ago, on the 16th of November, 2006, Rahimian declared that, quote, the Jew is the most stubborn enemy of the believers, and this decisive war will decide the fate of humanity. The reappearance of the 12th Imam will usher in a war between Israel and the Shia, end quote. Many Western commentators <coughs> ignore such pronouncements because they are so crazy. But were Hitler's speeches any less crazy? Hitler sincerely believed his propaganda and attempted in his peculiar sense of the world to free the world of the Jews by murdering them. Islamists, too, genuinely believe in their own hate-filled tirades. They celebrate suicide attacks on any and all Jews as acts of liberation. The fact that people who are not Islamists participate in this jubilation reveals a second similarity with the Nazi era. I'm referring here to the impact of anti-Semitic brainwashing techniques which have been refined since the days of Josef Goebbels. One of the instruments of this brainwashing is a Hezbollah satellite TV channel, al which reaches millions of people in the Arab and Islamic worlds. Its popularity is due to its countless video clips which use exciting graphics and stirring music to promote suicide bombing. Indeed, Almana has made the protocols of the Elders of Zion, Hitler's textbook for the Holocaust, into a soap opera. Episode by episode, the series peddles the fantasy of the Jewish world conspiracy. Jews unleashed both world wars, Jews discovered chemical weapons, Jews destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki with nuclear bombs. In short, Jews have brought nothing but death and destruction upon humanity. The most bloodthirsty themes are brought into Muslim family homes by al -Manar. In one such scene, a rabbi says to a young Jew, quote, we have received an order from above, we need the blood of a Christian child for the unleavened bread for the Passover feast. In the following shot, a terrified youngster is seized from the neighborhood. Then, the camera zooms in on the child for a close-up, his throat being cut. The blood spurts from the wound and pours into a metal basin. Here, medieval anti-Semitism is being drummed into the collective consciousness of normal Muslim families with a suggestive force comparable to that of Nazi productions such as the film Yudzis. A child who has seen this scene of slaughter will be affected for the rest of his life. It will take generations to remove this mental poison from people's minds. When the Hezbollah provoked war with Israel broke out in summer 2006, this investment in mass anti-Semitism paid off. Think of the pictures of the dead civilians in Lebanon and of the children of Beit Hanun killed by a stray Israeli shell. When Israel's army is compelled to defend itself, the results are not pretty for either side. But what is decisive is the context in which one views such images, where the emotional infrastructure of anti-Semitism has been built up by a steady stream of propaganda over many years, the meaning of such images is self-evident. By such means, an eliminatory hatred of Israel and the Jews has been fostered on a mass scale, including in people who have nothing to do with Hezbollah. Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, who as a leader of Hezbollah is responsible for al mana can't feel satisfied. 
There is yet another point of contact with National Socialism, albeit a bizarre one, and that is Holocaust denial, <coughs> as posed by the Iranian president with the acclaim of Hamas and Hezbollah. Here, either the dead are murdered a second time since it is denied that they were killed the first time, or the victims are subjected to anti-Semitic mockery, as in the Iranian cartoons, one of which showed Anne Frank in bed with Hitler. This is to us unimaginable malice, but it is nonetheless a part of Iranian foreign policy. I will return to this issue later. The fact is that not a single Muslim or Jew would have been killed this summer if Hamas and Hezbollah had decided to pursue peace rather than war. Once again, Judeophobia has led to a terrible suffering. Peace in the Middle East requires a struggle against this hate propaganda, but what is the reason for this hatred? Is it Zionism and Israeli policies? Or might it be that Judeophobia is an integral part of Islam? Why and how did anti-Semitism come to the region? These are the issues I want to address now. The approach I intend to take is a historical one. So my talk centers on four excursions into history. The first takes us back 80 years. What were the relations between Jews and Muslims like in the Egypt of the 1920s? Prepare yourself for a surprise. In the 1920s, the Jews of Egypt were not isolated and hated, but an accepted and protected part of public life. They had members of parliament, were employed at the royal palace and occupied important positions in the economic and political spheres. The Egyptian population, too, were favorable inclined towards the Jews. Just, uh, I at some calls on the transparency. Uh, mm -hmm. It merits emphasis, reported the Viennese journalist, that the Jewish shopkeeper and commission agent enjoy great popularity with the domestic population and are mostly considered to be very honest. End quote. How was this possible in a country where Islam was the state religion? Astonishingly, the century-long history of Islamic modernism is now entirely forgotten. This phase began at the start of the 19th century, reaching full bloom between 1860 and 1930. For example, in 1839, the Ottoman Sultan decreed equality for Jews and Christians in and in 1956, this equality was established in law. This measure was motivated not only by pressure from the European colonial powers, but also by the desire of the Ottoman elite to draw closer to European civilization. Of course, the dimly status of the Jews meant that their situation did not improve everywhere and at once. Some Jewish communities in some Arab lands still suffered humiliations, but at least in the urban centers, Jews were permitted to become members of parliament, hold government posts, and after 1909 were recruited into the military. In the 1920s, the bulk of the Islamist elite no longer lived under Sharia law. King al Ataturk's regime abolished it in Turkey in 1924. In 1925, Iran began to secularize under Reza Shah. In Egypt, too, Sharia only applied in the personal sphere, otherwise the legal code was of European provenance. In this period, rather than the nation being a subunit of Islam, Islam was a subunit of the nation in which Muslims, Christians, and Jews enjoyed equal rights. The Zionist movement was likewise accepted with an open mind.
For example, the editor of the Egypt's Daily Al Acham wrote The Zionists are necessary for this region. The money they will bring in, the intelligence and the diligence, which is one of their characteristics, will without doubt bring new life to the country. In the same way, the former Egyptian minister Ahmed Saki wrote in 1922 that, quote, the victory of the Zionist idea is a turning point for the fulfillment of an ideal which is so dear to me, the revival of the Orient. Thus, in the year 1926, the Egyptian government extended a cordial welcome to a Jewish Teachers Association delegation from the British Mandate territory. Later, students from the Egyptian University traveled on an official visit to Tel Aviv <coughs> to take part in a sports competition there seems to be impossible today. When the conflict in Palestine escalated, in the year 1929, the Egyptian Interior Ministry ordered its press office to censor all anti-Zionist and anti-Jewish articles. Even in the year 1933, the Egyptian government allowed 1,000 new Jewish immigrants to land in Port Said on their way to Palestine. No wonder, therefore, that the German Nazi Party's Egyptian section was in despair in 1933. They wrote to the Berlin chiefs, the level of education of the broad masses is not advanced enough for the understanding of race theory. This was a spokesman for the Nazi of Cairo in 1933, an understanding of the Jewish threat has not yet been awakened here. To summarize our first trip into history, 30 years after the founding of the Zionist movement and 20 years before the creation of the State of Israel, relations between Jews and Muslims in Egypt, Turkey and Iran were better than ever before. The fact shows how flexible the Quran can be interpreted in a given historical situation. Admittedly, under European influence, Christian anti-Semitism had entered the region, but its influence was restricted to Christian circles in the East. It was during the 1930s that this began to change. And that brings me on to the second historical excursion. To Islamic tradi traditionalists, this advance of modernity was an outrage. Their resistance lays the groundwork for what is commonly described nowadays as the Islamist movement, that is to say a movement combining Islamic fundamentalism with jihad in the sense of permanent holy war. It was from the outset both anti-modern and anti-Jewish. Its three leading protagonists were Amin and Hussaini, appointed Mufti of Jerusalem, in 1921, the Syrian Sheikh Is al Din al Qassam, killed in 1934 by British soldiers, and the charismatic Hassan al Banna, who founded the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood <coughs> in the year 1928. <coughs> Their common teacher was Rashid Rida. <coughs> a religious scholar heavily influenced by the Saudi Wahhabites. Rida's three prominent students followed their master in demanding a return to Sharia law and traditional Islam as so to drive Western civilization from Palestine and the Arab world before going on to defeat it throughout the world. 
Their Judeophobia was a declaration of war on the invasion of the world of Islam by liberal ideas. Nowhere was the impact of this invasion so divisive as in Palestine. As the Mufti complained to a conference of religious teachers, the Jews have also spread their customs and usages that are opposed to our religion and to our whole way of life. Above all, our youth is being morally shattered. The Jewish girls who run around in shorts demoralize our youth by their mere presence. And there are a lot of statements like this. For El Husseini, Jerusalem was a focal point of the rebirth of Islam in its pure version. And Palestine was a center from which the struggle against modernity and the Jews was to start. However, for the time being, the anti-Jewish pogroms with which the Mufti organized in Palestine in the 1920s found no echo in the rest of the Arab world. Let me sum up this part. Why did the conflict between Zionism and anti-Zionism appeared on the surface to be about land, it concealed within it a far bigger conflict over the question of how to relate to modernity. While the modernizers, as a rule, sought compromise with the Zionists, the Islamists denounced any attempt to reach an understanding with the Jews as treachery. In the year 1937, Britain put forward the first two-state solution in the history of the Middle East conflict in the form of the Peel Plan. This compromise was initially supported not only by the Zionists, but also by moderate Palestinians and several Arab governments. The Mufti, on the other hand, decisively rejected this partition plan and would eventually succeed in imposing his view. However, until Mid-1937, the balance of forces between the two currents was more or less in equilibrium. But thereafter, the picture began to change. Now, Nazi Germany threw its weight onto the side of the Islamists, which brings me on to my third topic. struggle against France and Britain. He knew the nature of the Nazi regime and for that very reason was seeking an alliance with it as early as spring 1933. Berlin was at first demissive. On the one hand, Hitler had already stated his belief in the racial inferiority of the Arabs in Mein Kampf, while on the other, the Nazis were extremely anxious not to jeopardize British appeasement. In June 1937, however, the Nazis changed course. The trigger was the Peel Plan's two-state solution. Berlin wanted at all costs to prevent the birth of a Jewish state and thus welcomed the Mufti's advances. Arab anti-Semitism would now get a powerful new promoter. A central role in the propaganda offensive was played by the Nazi wireless station, now almost totally forgotten. <coughs> Since the 1936 Berlin Olympics, a village called Ziesen, located in the south of Berlin, had been home to what was at the time the world's most powerful shortwave radio transmitter. Between April 1939 in April 1945, six years old, radio season reached out to the illiterate Muslim masses through daily Arabic programs, 
which also went out in Persian and Turkish. At that time, listening to the radio in the Arab world took place primarily in public squares or bazaars or coffee houses. No other station was more popular than this Nazi season service, which skillfully mingled anti-Semitic propaganda with quotations from the Quran and Arabic music. The Second World War allies were presented as luckies of the Jews and a picture of the <coughs> United Jewish Nations drummed into the audience. At the same time, the Jews were attacked as the worst enemies of Islam. Quote, the Jew, since the time of Muhammad, has never been a friend of the Muslim. The Jew is the enemy and it pleases Allah to kill him, end quote, from Radio Sikh. Since 1941, Season's Arabic program had been directed by the Mufti of Jerusalem, who had emigrated to Berlin. No less important than this technical innovation was the fact that the Mufti invented a new form of Judeophobia by recasting it in an Islamic mode. The Mufti wanted, quote, to unite all the Arab lands in common hatred of the British and Jews, as he wrote in a letter to Adolf Hitler. But European anti-Semitism had proved an ineffective tool in the Arab world. Why? Because the European fantasy of the Jewish world conspiracy was totally foreign to the original Islamic view of the Jews. Only in the legend of Jesus Christ did the Jews appear as a deadly and powerful force who allegedly went so far as to kill God's only son. Islam was quite a different story. Here it was not the Jews who murdered the prophet, but the prophet who in Medina murdered the Jews. As a result, the, the characteristic features of Christian anti-Semitism did not arise in the Muslim world. There were no fears of Jewish conspiracy and domination, no charges of diabolic evil. Instead, the Jews were treated with contempt or condescending tolerance. This cultural inheritance made the idea that the Jews of all people could represent a permanent danger for the Muslims and the world seem absurd. The Mufti, therefore, ceased to the only instrument that really moved the Arab masses, Islam. He was the first <coughs> to translate Christian anti-Semitism into Islamic language, thus creating an Islamic anti-Semitism. His first major manifesto bore the title, Islam Judaism, Appeal of the Grand Mufti to the Islamic World in the year 1937. This 31-page pamphlet reached the entire Arab world, and there are indications that Nazi agents helped draw it up. Let me quote at least a short passage from it. The struggle between the Jews and Islam began when Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina. The Jewish methods were, even in those days, the same as now. As always, their weapon was slender. They said that Muhammad was a swindler. They began to ask Muhammad senseless and insoluble questions, and they endeavored to destroy the Muslims. If the Jews could betray Muhammad in this way, how will they betray Muslims today? the verses of the Quran and Hadith proof to you that the Jews were the fiercest opponents of Islam and are still trying to destroy it, and so on and so forth, the whole time, 31 pages. So what we have here is a new popularized form of Judeophobia based on the Oriental folktale tradition which moves constantly back and forth between the seventh and 20, uh, 20th centuries. Classical Islamic literature had as a rule treated Muhammad's clash with the Jews of Medina as a minor episode in the Prophet's life. 
the anti-Jewish passages in the Quran and Hadith had lain dormant or considered of little significance during previous centuries. These elements were now invested with new life and vigor. Now the Mufti began to ascribe a truly cosmic significance to the allegedly hostile attitude of the new Jewish tribe of Medina to the Prophet. Now he pit out the occasional outbursts of hatred found in the Quran and Hadith and drummed them relentlessly into the minds of Muslims at every available opportunity, including via the Arabic shortwave radio station in Birmingham. Radio season was a success not only in Cairo. It made an impact in Tehran as well. One of its regular listeners was a certain Ruhollah Khomeini. When in the winter of 1938, the 36-year-old Khomeini returned to the Iranian city of Qom from Iraq, he, quote, had brought with him a radio receiver set made by the British company Pi. The radio proved a good buy. Many mullahs would gather at his home, often on the terrace in the evenings, to listen to Radio Berlin and the BBC, writes his biographer Amir Tahiri. Even the German consulate in Tehran was surprised by the success of this propaganda. Throughout the country, spirit, uh, spiritual leaders are coming out and saying that the 12th Imam has been sent into the world by God in the form of Adolf Hitler, we learn from a report to Berlin in February 1941. So, quote, without any legation involvement, an increasingly effective form of propaganda has arisen which sees the Führer in Germany as an answer to every prayer. One way to promote this trend is sharply to emphasize Muhammad's struggle against Jews in the old days and that of the Führer today. And while Khomeini was not a follower of Hitler, those years may well have shaped his anti-Jewish attitudes which are expressed today by Ahmadinejad. So let me now summarize my third point. In the year 1937, Germany began to disseminate an Islamic anti-Semitism that fuses together the traditional Islamic view that the Jews are inferior with a European notion that they are divisively powerful. At one and the same time, we find the Jews being derided as pigs and apes, while simultaneously being demonized as the puppet masters of world politics. This specific form of anti-Semitism was broadcast to the Islamic world on Radio Tzid. At the same time, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood was being heavy, heavily subsidized by Nazi Germany and its anti-Jewish agitation promoted. There could no longer be any talk of a balance between Islamic modernizers and Islamists. Radio season keys operation in April 1945. But it was only after the date that its frequencies of hate really began to reverberate in the Arab world. And so I come on to my fourth <coughs> and final point. After 8th of May 1945, National Socialism was placed under the ban virtually throughout the world. In the Arab world, however, Nazi ideology continued to reverse to reverberate. In her report on the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann, Hannah Arendt discussed the reactions to the trial 
in the Arab media. Newspapers in Damascus and Beirut, in Cairo and Jordan, did not hide their sympathy for Eichmann or their regret that he had not finished the job. A broadcast from Cairo on the day the trial opened even injected a slightly anti-German note into its comments complaining that there was not a single incident in which one German plane flew over one Jewish settlement and dropped one bomb on it throughout the last war. The heartfelt wish to see what Jews eliminated was also expressed in April 2001 by the columnist Ahmad Araga of Egypt's second largest daily, the state-controlled al Akba. Give thanks to Hitler. He took revenge of, on the Israelis in advance on behalf of the Palestinians. Our one complaint against him was that his revenge was not complete enough. And for him, for Robert Rodriguez, I can give you many more quotes like that. Manifestly, following the 8th of May, there occurred a twofold division of the world. The division in the political and economic system is well known as a Cold War. A second split, which was obscured by the Cold War, concerned the acceptance and continuing influence of national socialist forms of thought. The fault line was already traced by 1946, and it had much to do with the period's most renowned Arab politician, the former Mufti of Jerusalem, and much to do as well with the opportunism of the West. In 1946, El Hosseini was sought by, among others, Britain and the USA on war crime crimes charges. Between 1941 and 1945, he directed the Muslim SS divisions from Berlin, and he is personally responsible for the fact that thousands of Jewish children who might otherwise have been saved died in the gas chambers. All this was known in 1946. Nonetheless, Britain and the USA chose to forego criminal prosecution of Hussein in order to avoid spoiling their relations with the Arab world. France, in whose custody Hussein was being held, deliberately let him get away. The years of Nazi Arabic language propaganda had made the Mufti by far the best known political figure in the Arab and Islamic world. But the 1946 de facto amnesty by the Western powers enhanced the Mufti's prestige even more. The Arabs saw in this impunity, wrote Simon Wiesenthal in the year 1946, quote, not only a weakness of the Europeans, but also absolution for past and future occurrences. A man who is an enemy number one of a powerful empire, and this empire cannot fend him off, seems to the Arabs to be a political leader. Now the pro-Nazi past began to become a source of pride, not of shame. When on the 10th of June 1946, the headlines of the world press announced the Mufti's escape from France, the, Ira, the uh, Arab quarters of Jerusalem and all the Arab towns and villages were garlanded and beflagged, and the great man's poetry was to be seen everywhere, reports a contemporary observer. Mm -hmm. But the biggest cheerleaders for the Mufti were the Muslim brothers, who at that time could mobilize a million people in Egypt alone. It was they, indeed, who had organized the Mufti's return and from the start defended his Nazi activities from any criticism. The two opposed views of the Holocaust collided in November 1947 in the General Assembly of the United Nations. On the one side were those 
who considered the Shoah a tragedy and therefore argued for a partition of Palestine and the founding of two Palestine states, an Arab Muslim state and a Jewish state. On the other, those who opposed a two-state solution in principle and whose most influential representative was none other than Amin and Husseini, yet again playing the role of spokesman for the Palestinian Arabs. On El Husseini's view, just a second, I got a transparency. You see, <clears throat> on El Husseini's view, the Arabs, quote, should jointly attack the Jews and destroy them as soon as the British forces have withdrawn from the Palestinian Mandan territory. <coughs> The Muslim Brotherhood likewise interpreted the United Nations Revolution from the standpoint of its anti-Semitic worldview. <coughs> Hassan al-Banna, the Brotherhood's leader, quote, considered the whole United Nations intervention to be an international plot carried out by the Americans, the British and the Russians under the influence of Zionism, end quote. So, as in 1946, with the triumphant return of the Mufti, in 1947, the reality of the Holocaust was denied a second time. But there was yet a third viewpoint to be found in the Arab world in 1947. That of those who were not interested in the Holocaust for its own sake, but who supported the partition plan for pragmatic reasons. Particularly in Palestine, there were many Arabs who were in favor of partition because they knew that the fight against partition was futile because the Arabs had no arms and the Jews had the support of the United States and Britain. Or because they were among the tens of thousands of laborers who advanced the Jewish economy, especially by working in the citrus groves. Uh. Many Palestinian Arabs thus not only refrained from fighting themselves, but also did their best to prevent foreigners and locals from carrying out military actions, write Hillel Cohn, the first scholar systematically to investigate the movement of so-called Arab collaborators. Avoidance of war and even agreement with the Jews were, in their view, best for the Palestinian Arab nation. This group included the Arab leaders who sympathized with the partition plan, albeit only in private, since they were afraid openly to contradict the Mufti and the Muslim Brotherhood. Among them were Abdullah Ibn of Trans uh, Transjordan, Sidki Pasha, Prime Minister of Egypt, Abd al-Rahman Assam, head of the Arab League, and Musahim al-Pashashi, former Prime Minister of Iraq, who argued that, quote, eventually there would have to be an acceptance of the Jewish state's existence, but for now it was politically impossible to acknowledge this publicly. To do so, he said, was, would cause a revolt in Iraq. So the cowardice of the Arab leaders and the cynicism of the West who let the Mufti escape paved the way for one of the most fateful watersheds of the 20th century, the Arab military assault on Israel in the year 1948. In 1952, the defeat of the Arab armies in this conflict brought to power yet another former fellow traveler of the Nazis, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nasser had the protocol of the Arab of Zion disseminated throughout the Arab world, and in 1964 was still assuring the Deutsche Nationalzeitung that, quote, the lie about the six million murdered Jews is not taken seriously by anyone, end quote. Now, it was the turn of the Soviet Union to find no difficulty in overlooking the anti-Semitism and Holocaust negationism of an airline. 
Moreover, Nasser employed many of the Nazi war criminals who had evaded justice through fleeing to Egypt in their former sphere of expertise, the anti-Jewish propaganda. After Nasser's military campaign against Israel also failed miserably in the Six Day War of 1967, the previously incited hate against Jews was once more radicalized in an Islamist direction. Nasser's anti-Jewish propaganda was still accompanied by a fondness of life's pleasures. Now, anti-Semitism was mixed with the Islamists' hatred for sensuality and joy in life, and popularized a religious resistance against all corruptors of the world. Now, it was discovered that not only was everything Jewish evil, but that everything evil was Jewish. Thus, the most important manifesto of Islamist anti-Semitism, the essay, I was troubled with the Jews by the Muslim brother Said Qutb, distributed in millions of copies throughout the Islamic world, the Saudi Arabian help, declares with allusions to Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, and Emil Durkheim, that the Jews are responsible for the worldwide moral and sexual decline. Quote, behind the doctrine of atheistic materialism was a Jew, behind the doctrine of animalistic sexuality was a Jew, and behind the destruction of the family and the shattering of sacred relationships in society was a Jew. Now Palestine was declared sacred Islamic territory, where Jews should not be allowed to govern even a single village, and Israel's destruction a religious duty. Intellectual devastation now spread unimpeded. Jews started to be denigrated by reference to further in the Quran as pigs and apes, and the claim that the consumption of non-Jewish blood or the religious right for Jews was offered up as a scientific discovery. The first victims of the Islamist turn were the Muslims <coughs> themselves. The struggle against depravity means the suppression of one's own sensual needs and the return to sacred social bonds means the archaic subjugation of women. With the Iranian revolution in 1979, Islamism gained its first great victory. Three years later, Hezbollah, under the influence of Khomeini, began systematically to use human beings as bombs. The hatred of Jews was not greater than the fear of death. Whenever the possibility of a peaceful solution appeared on the horizon, it would be drowned in the blood of suicidal mass murders. The first major series of suicide bombings began in Palestine in 1993, at precisely the moment when the Oslo peace process was underway. It was resumed in October 2000 after Israel withdrew from Lebanon and had made its most far-reaching concessions yet to the Palestinian side of Camp David. It was the same logic that dictated that in 2005, Israel's withdrawal from Gaza would be met by a hail of rocket attacks. So, what overall conclusions can be drawn from our short historical survey? Three points. <coughs> Firstly, as regards to the Islamic world, History shows that how a Muslim defines his relationship to Israel and the Jews is a strictly personal decision. The Mufti made a deliberate choice to torpedo any solution through dialogue. And Hamas too has made a deliberate choice to want to destroy Israel. There is nothing inevitable about such decisions. This statement of the obvious is regrettably not obvious to everyone. In Tom Segev's bestseller, One Palestine Complete, for example, we find in you the idea fix of two completely unified peoples confronting one another. Each wants a country for itself, therefore the Jews kill the Arabs, and the Arabs kill the Jews, a spiral of violence for which both sides are deemed equally responsible. This theory will never withstand analysis. 
in the Zionist camp, fundamentalist positions have always existed as well. But here they have been either kept under control by state institutions or marginalized by society, while on the Palestinian side the spirit of the Mufti continues to prevail and seeks to silence any deviation. Secondly, as regards Europe, here we can see how catastrophic the consequences of European appeasement of Islamism have been and are today. Amin al Husseini was installed and promoted by European powers. In 1921, it was the British who appointed him Mufti against the will of the majority of Palestinians. It was the Germans who, between 1937 and 1945, paid for his services. And it was the French who let him flee to Egypt in 1946, so enabling him to resume his activities. Despite this co-responsibility for the situation, Europe's politicians and media continue to refuse to recognize the existence of the Islamist anti-Semitism of Hezbollah and Hamas. But if this factor is ignored, the scale of Islamist terror becomes a new measure of Israel's guilt. The principle then is the more barbarous anti-Jewish terrorism becomes, the more guilty Israel is. However, those who make Israel the scapegoat for Islamist violence are not only dancing to the Islamist tune, they are also subscribing to the latest version of the hoary old European anti-Semitic notion that the Jews were behind everything bad, <coughs> even when they are themselves the victims. The absence of clarity is thus the beginning of complicity. Finally, on anti-Semitism itself, the historical record gives a lie to the assumption that Islamic anti-Semitism <coughs> is caused by Zionism or Israeli policy. In fact, it is not the escalation of the Middle East conflict that has given rise to anti-Semitism, it is rather anti-Semitism that has given rise to the escalation of the Middle East conflict again and again. There is a sure way of identifying the real roots of such anti-Semitism, and that is to look at the current attitude in this part of the world to Hitler and the Nazis. If Germans in Beirut, Damascus, and Amman are greeted with compliments for Adolf Hitler, this can hardly be Israel's doing. When Iranian cartoons show Anna Frank in bed with Adolf Hitler, what on earth has this to do with Zionism? Today, Ahmadinejad is further whipping up Judeophobia with his Holocaust denial campaign. Those who deride the Holocaust as a fairy tale are implicitly claiming that the Jews have been duping the rest of humanity for the past 60 years. Those who talk about the so-called Holocaust are insinuating that 90% of the world's media is controlled by the Jews who are systematically preventing us from learning the real truth. But those who view the Jews in such kind of global force even cannot sincerely criticize Hitler's final solution. Instead, they will deny the Holocaust to the outside world by secretly drawing inspiration from it as a kind of precedent that proves it can be done, that one can murder millions of Jews. Every denial of the Holocaust contains an implicit appeal for its repetition. This anti-Semitism cannot be mitigated by anything Jews do or by any conciliatory step the Israeli government may take. Those who have fallen prey to the demonizing delusions of anti-Semitism are bound to find their prejudices confirmed by whatever the Israeli government does or does not do. Islamic anti-Semitism has nothing to do with ethnic characteristics or cultural peculiarities. In fact, 
what we are seeing is a revival of Nazi ideology in a new form. Let me therefore end with an appeal by a Muslim, a scholar of Islam, Basam TV, who was invited also to this lecture series, quote, only when the public take the appropriate stand against the anti-Semitic dimension of Islamism, will it be possible to say that they have truly understood the lessons of the Holocaust? Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, delve into your two references about the coming of the 12th Imam. It's my understanding that among the Shia Muslims that there is a religious fervor which coupled with the feeling that an apocalyptic event such as a nuclear war might very well lead to the coming of the 12th Imam. Does that exist in the Sunni portion of the Muslim population, or is that unique to the Shia belief? Um, there are some references in the Sunni religion as well in this part of Muslim, but it's much more stronger in Shia. So we, uh, we have it in both parts in a way, but in Shia is a real, true, uh, uh, everyday religion. <coughs> And uh, so uh, there are different interpretations. And when the Imam will awake again, some say, after all Jews are killed. This is the interpretation by some uh, grand ayatollahs in uh, uh, Iran. Some say, uh, if peace is on earth, then he will come. Some say, we have to organize a big chaos, uh, have a rock, and then he will come. So th there are different interpretations. By, but of course, if you see Ahmadinejad, his, uh, 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 how he commits policy. Uh, he's really, he, he built even uh, uh, a train track uh, so that when the Imam will, will appear again, he, he have a better ride to the center of Tehran. So he's, they are really believing in what they're saying. Uh, it's not a joke, it's not, you know, and it's very, very important for us to try to take every word seriously. <coughs> And uh, therefore, I'm, I appreciate the question. This is a very important point. Uh, I'm glad you started the talk by talking about the good relations between Jews and Muslims uh, in Egypt in the 20s, being the grandson of a woman who used to go around her uh, neighborhood and turn off people's lights on Friday nights because most of her friends were Jewish. And I've always been proud of the fact that uh, Egypt doesn't have the same disgusting history against the Jews that Europe has had. Uh, but I don't think that your, your hypothesis really explains the position of Jews in Egypt well into the 50s. Because you've given many quotes about from Hassan Benna and many other people uh, saying all types of things, but uh, there were over 100,000 Jews that lived in Egypt well into the 50s. Could you list for us, <coughs> with all this rabid Nazism in Egypt, what were, uh, how many hundreds of Jews were killed? If there were, as you said, a million uh, uh, people in the Islamic Brotherhood, in the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, how many hundreds or thousands of Jews uh, were killed? And could it be, so you didn't really consider the alternative hypothesis, which is that, you know, 700,000 Palestinians uh, were, uh, you know, pushed out of Israel, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the gang rapes that Penny Morris talks about and so on do any of these things and then occupation play any role in the conflict or is it simply, you know, uh, Muslim state Jews? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, it was a smoothly change in Egypt. It was slow. For example, when the Muslim Brotherhood in the uh, year 1936, 1937 wanted to get the mosques as a place for incitement against Jews, uh, the, 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 the official uh, 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 imams f forbade it. They were against inciting Jews at that time. Al-Azhar was led by an imam 
who didn't want to have uh, anti-Jewish incitement in his mosque at that time. So it was a very smooth and slow development uh, uh, until a lot of people uh, uh, expected a rommel with very much joy in the Second World War later, in 1942. And, uh, but, um, so uh, we don't have <coughs> massacres or something like that. The, the, the very first pogrom against Jews in Egypt took place in November 1946, which is remarkable, isn't it? After Auschwitz occurred and everything. So this very first pogrom took place in, uh, in, in about, uh, I have to look up in my book, it's written down, about five or six Jews were killed, not more. So you have to relativize this. Is what, there, were, there were no big mosques. But there was a, a mood that encouraged the Muslim Brotherhood to do such things. And of course, this was also at the same time a kind of incitement uh, against Zionism, against Israel, and against peace with this new state, and of course incitement also against uh, this kind of uh, two-state solution uh, decided by the United Nations uh, 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 Council. So, um, I think there is certainly an interrelationship between developments in the Middle East and the existence of Israel and the mobilization of anti-Semites around the world all the time. But these are, uh, you know, the, the relationship is not a cause, it is more or less a pretext. And if you, for example, listen to the Islamists, if you listen to Ahmadinejad, he's saying that the big struggle began 300 years ago, or 400 years ago, hundreds of years ago. So, uh, for him, the Middle East conflict is a kind of pretext uh, uh, in order to fight with more efficacy uh, the liberal ideas of modernity. And, and so, I think we have to make a very, very clear uh, 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 separation. Certainly, the policy of Israel government, like that of any other government, may give rise to anger and criticism, but no Israeli policy, however deserving of criticism <coughs> it may be, makes plausible the anti Semite assumption that, for example, Washington is ruled by Jerusalem and that the Pesach meal is prepared with the blood of murdered children. So, we have to make a big separation between those both things. And when you mention the 700,000 Palestinians, well, uh, I think. The, you know, uh, what a social scientist has to do is to reduce suffering in the world. So empathy is something universal, also with these Palestinians. But if you see the history, you see only two leaders of the Palestinian people, the Arab Palestinian people, <laughs> only the Mufti of Jerusalem and Arafat, who was chosen by the Mufti, by the way. So um, this is a terrible history. And those leaders always ignored the wish to, to live, in a way. So I think it's very important, in this summer, in 2007, the book of Hillel Cohn will, will be published by the University of California Press about all those Arab Palestinians who were in favor of a peaceful solution, lived side by side with the Zionists. The PLO history systematically ignores these factors, and we are very much uh, influenced by the peer of history. So I think it's very, very uh, necessary that we will get a real picture of what the Palestinian Arabs thought at different times. And then we will see the picture is much more complicated than people uh, very often think. May I ask, um, you, you've given talked a lot about an analogy or a similarity or even an identity uh, between uh, Hitler's attitudes and the, the Islamic attitude that you spoke to. Um, I, I want to ask your view about another possible similarity then that would follow from that. Uh, it, 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 it seems to me it is absolutely clear uh, that with Hitler and the people who thought like him, um, this was a struggle to the death, one side or the other. That is to say, either he had to be simply eliminated, and not just him, but the whole range of people who felt like him, 
or, or the Jews who are in mortal danger. Um, would you say the same thing uh, about the current situation in the Middle East? Too? That this, this is as you have portrayed it and given the power of the analogy, this is simply a struggle to the death on one side or the other. Well, if you hear some statements by imams, they are saying the time of liberation or redemption uh, will come once the <coughs> Jews. It's, it's not this kind of struggle of death, but redemption. And, uh, you know, we will be free if the Jews are killed. So you have very often these kind of statements. But I think, you know, um, we, we have to compare Islamism with national socialism. We can't equate it. And this the, the, the anti-Semitisms are different. I will tell you why. Uh, one point is that, for example, Islamists, of course, are fundamentalists, which means they think Charles Darwin was sent by the Jews in order to uh, falsify the Quran. The Quran says another story about the evolution of man than Charles Darwin did. So, the Islamists deny uh, everything Charles Darwin had written. And it's, uh, you know, very dangerous to, to, to have a positive point of view concerning Charles Darwin within their uh, uh, groups of people. Uh, so they are not racist in that way. Which means the National Socialists, they, they had a racist understanding, social Darwinism, uh, about races above and uh, lower and, and so, uh, the, you know, you don't have the word uh, Halbjude in Islamic language, which is a racist word, a half Jew. This is uh, only connected to the biological uh, racism uh, of Europe, of, of, of modernity in Europe. In Islam, it's quite another thing. Uh, you also have disabled people are very, very honored within Islam. And, and you don't have, you know, the desire to kill the last baby, which is Jewish, and the last grandfather, which is Jewish, from every part of Europe. This is very special uh, 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 Nazi ideology, and this is for the singular event, which will not repeat in this way. And so, there is a uh, differentiation. That is the reason why, for example, uh, it's possible for Jews to survive in Tehran, with Ahmadine Judge. Although I, I also think sometimes that the Jews in Tehran are a good thing to blackmail Israel, not to do anything. You know, he can revenge with the Jews in Tehran. So there are different, you know, explanations. But, but it's, it's, it's not identical. You, you, you have to make this separation concerning racism, and uh, racism is a very European, uh, modern ideology. So, so are you saying that, notwithstanding the virulence of the, of the current views? That site of Islam, that there is a possibility of coexistence, of, what, of isolating this group, of, of limiting them? I mean, yes. Well, uh, this is my, my whole talk about uh, well, that, that there is a possibility. Well, I don't hear the possibility. Well, you can't see it at the time, perhaps, but, but if you see history, times existed, uh, and, and there is no, you know, there is no law in Quran. If you if you have the Quran, you, you, you can lick, lick, lick Sorry, legitimize the existence of Israel with the Quran as well as the destruction of Israel. So it's a, it's a question of interpretation, as always. And so uh, I think it's very important. I, I was really amazed to, 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 to see that this 100 years of Islamic modernism is really forgotten today, which shows that a kind of dealing. Uh, is possible without this uh, ugly Um Yeah, actually, a friend of mine who's Palestinian, I'm not a Muslim, by the way, just, just for the record. <laughs> but a friend of mine who's Palestinian Muslim said, uh, if you go to this talk, you should thank uh, you and Charles Small for Zionists like you who are picking a fight with the whole Muslim world, essentially because that mobilizes the Muslim world to come help us. Uh, otherwise, they're not helping us. Most of them are run by dictators who are loyal to America, like Egypt, like Jordan, and other places. And so maybe this is helpful. I'm not listening to his advice, obviously. Uh, I do. <laughs> this is my country. 
I do want to say a couple of things. You, you have a selective historiography. For example, when you talk about Hitler, Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, also lists Muslims and Arabs as basically subhuman, as that they are also I, like... I thought about that. Right? But, but the, the more important thing, which you didn't mention, is that in Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, the only good group of Jews that he mentions are the Zionists. He says that it's a great group out of Vienna, and that they happen to validate my view, because I used to think that Judaism is a religion, and Zionists proved to me by an attitude of segment of Jews themselves that Judaism is not a religion, but a nationality, a group of people distinct. And then, as a result of this, there was immediately collaboration between the Nazis and the Zionists, articulated in books by Jews like Lenny Brenner, for example, 51 Documents, History of the Nazi-Zionist Collaboration, <coughs> books like Edwin Black uh, about the transfer agreement, which talks about the Nazis, <laughs> and about the boycott of Nazi Germany that was started in the 30s by socialist Jews, that was broken by Zionist people that you support and so on. This is selective historiography, and I'm, I'm asking you to think seriously about why, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to... I mean, I'm a Palestinian Christian, okay? You were saying that there was the Mufti and there was Yafar, but they are the leaders of the Palestinian nonsense. There were three Palestinian factions in the 60s when the PLO was established. Two of them were led by Palestinian Christians. I'll stop with you. So it was not Muslims, it was Palestinians fighting for independence against colonial occupation. Okay. Thank you very much for this um, uh, contribution. Um, you know, I'm, you can tell your friend, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm even not, not Jewish. You think I'm a Zionist, why? Just, just the anti-Semitism <laughs> has nothing to do with Jews. It has only something to do with, with anti-Semites. Yeah, being Zionist doesn't mean being Jewish. Huh? There are Zionist Christians also. There are Zionist Muslims. Okay, but, but you know, this is you can tell it to your friend. Okay. So, so, um, uh, and, and, and if you go back to history, uh, it's very interesting, and I, I bring a lot of sources in my book, which is uh, in English in, in the spring 2007, uh, available. Um, the, 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 the modern anti-Semitic, anti-Zionism by the Nazis. The first book was written in the year 1921, Der Staatsfeind Zionismus by Rosenberg. It was an anti-Zionist book, of course. And they always hated the idea that the Zionists could form an own state in Palestine. And Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf that this kind of state must be. And we have to fight it. So you can show me your, your, your part of Mein Kampf. I would be very interested, but I don't believe it. They don't exist. Uh, is Hitler is against Zionism from the very first beginning. And when, of course, there was a kind of agreement uh, for a, a couple of years, and there was a, some uh, consideration um, um, uh, with the, uh, uh, how was it called, uh, Havara Agreement, uh, how to get out Jews out of uh, Germany and, 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 and have some, some you know, uh, um, economical advantage out of it. So this, this was a kind of agreement, but when it came to the year 1937, that a real Jewish state could then, they changed the course. And there are extremely many uh, 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 papers and documents which uh, really show that in the middle of the year 1937, the Nazis, you know, discovered the Arabs as a possible uh, alliance party against Jews. So, um, I think, I don't know, I think that was, yes. I just want to make a brief comment to this gentleman here because I'm utterly and totally baffled that a person who is a, a German, non-Jewish, who researches and writes about Jew hatred, turn, automatically turns into a Zionist. I, I don't quite understand that process. <laughs> you made the statement that no matter what the Jews will be doing or can do, it won't help. But what would help? 
of the Charter of Hamas, up to now. Every journalist is talking about suicide bombing, but no one knows the original text of this charter, which is really uh, uh, something very, very upset, upsetting. Uh, so in, in, in Europe, there is no talk about this kind of anti-Semitism, which is, of course, uh, uh, rooted in Europe. So this is a big contradiction. So. So I think this is one of the very, very important points uh, to, to show the public and to show journalists and to, to, to make this uh, well known that there is a real, uh, uh, like Nazi anti-Semitism, not the same but in the new garb, uh, anti-Semitism going on in these parts of the world. So this is perhaps the first thing. And the second thing I think is, which is very important, um, my whole talk was against the notion that every Muslim is the same. Uh, and history shows that there were different uh, 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 developments, even within the Muslim societies. And so I think if you have today Ahmadinejad, who is proud that the Iranian regime sent so many kids onto the minefields during the war against Iraq, they sent 10,000 of kids, of Iranian kids, onto the minefields to sacrifice the children in order to win the war against Iraq. And those kids are to take, today hailed as martyrs. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's, it's really a kind of a loving of death, a longing for death. Uh, and, and, and they also invented, uh, in the following years, this kind of suicide bombing. So in my opinion, you have two directions. Islamism today is connected with suicide bombing, with a longing for death. And I don't believe that the majority of the Muslim people of the world are going to long for death. I think they love life as we all love life. So I think this question has to be raised. What direction do we want to go? And there's a very good example um, for example, uh, the American policies when, when Ahmadinejad made his letter to Bush a couple of months ago. You remember the, the, the big letter from yeah. Ahmadinejad to Bush and so on and so forth. Um, I think the Bush administration in this special point failed to consider the text in terms of its inherent logic. They said, well, it's nothing in it about the nuclear issue and the United States, uh, the United Security Council things going on. So they didn't really analyze this document, this letter by Ahmadinejad. But this letter is saying, you know, this Islamist motto, you love life, we love death, is expressed in this letter in a somewhat watered down variant I quote it, a bad ending belongs only to those who have chosen the life of this world. A good land and eternal paradise belong to those servants who fear his majesty and do not follow their uh, selves. So this is, in another way, uh, the same content. We love death, we do love life. And then he continued, those with insights can already hear the sounds of the shattering and fall of the ideology and thought of the liberal democracy democratic systems. So I think we have to uh, submit these sentences to the Muslims in the world uh, saying you have a choice, liberal democracy or longing for death. And I think if you make it clear, if you put the ideology of these guys like Ahmadinejad in the forefront, instead of separating the ideology from the so-called doable <coughs> items, like the nuclear question, isolated from everything else, um, you can perhaps uh, develop a better understanding 
or what's going on within the Muslim world as well. So I think we have to talk about this ideology and we have to uh, uh, really uh, make it public what they really want. So, I have no better idea. Huh? Who will do it? Who will do it? Just before Paul asks the question, just to make a point, if you go to, to Google and, and do a Google search for Hamas Covenant, you can actually get an English translation. It was translated actually by a project here at Yale called the Avalon Project. So it's very accessible and I try to distribute it as often as I can and it's amazing to see not only do they call for the destruction of Israel and the killing of Jews, but they actually base the entire document, it seems, on the protocols of the elders of Zion. That's quite shocking. So, you personally I want to begin by saying that I apologize for coming in late. I wish I had heard the beginning of the presentation. So if there's anything I say that was covered, I apologize. Um, um, I'm a Jewish American, um, and I've traveled extensively throughout the Muslim world. I've lived in Turkey for several years. I've traveled through Iran, through Syria, through Lebanon, through Jordan, through Palestine. Um, and I actually work for a human rights organization in the West Bank, and, and we'll be speaking actually tonight on my experiences um, working there alongside Palestinians and Israelis. And um, I want to respond, uh, I just want to, with regard to the Hamas covenant, which was, um, which was just referenced here, I think one of the reasons why uh, oftentimes uh, the assumption is that, for example, the speaker would be Zionist, was because a lot of times it seemed that anti-Zionism um, anti was being somehow equated with anti-Semitism. And so for someone who's speaking out or, or, or sort of trying to shed some light on anti-Semitism, if we're hearing it equated with anti-Zionism, the assumption is that somewhere in there there's a protection or defense of Zionism. I, I hope that made sense. Perhaps it didn't. I'm getting a confused look. But um, that's not the point that I wanted to make. I, I just want to say that um, any, if for anybody who is interested in perhaps seeing a different perspective, you're welcome to challenge me. I will be talking about things such as Hamas, about my experiences as a Jewish American tonight, about uh, New Haven Free Public Library at 6.30. But what I wanted to ask you, what, what I wanted to ask you is I'm having trouble reconciling my experiences throughout the Muslim world, being welcomed into families, um, being my entire family being invited as a Jewish person, uh, people asking me questions about my religion exchanges. I'm having a lot of trouble reconciling that with a lot of the quotes that I've seen up here. And I guess I'm wondering uh, whether you think that this is just a sort of marginal Thing, or whether you believe this to be sort of a, a general phenomenon, um, and uh, particularly what experiences as you coming as an expert on anti-Semitism within the Islamic world, have you had experiences traveling through the Islamic world? What has your experience has been in the Islamic world, world itself, actually meeting people rather than just reading these documents? Well, thank you. You really missed my first part. I'm very sorry about that. I'm sorry so, too. What is what is your explanation? Why was a goddess trip? It was South Lebanon, there was no people in East World after this. But this kind of getting more weapons in, uh, continue the fight, instead of creating a very good model society. May I respond? Sure. So in the case of Gaza, for example, 8,000 settlers were removed from Gaza, but 13,000 homes for new settlers were built in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. So in other words, um, the, the, the settler population rose rather than shrank, and the occupation itself never officially ended. The water areas, the air, etc. The there was not. Okay, okay, thank you, but I'm sorry. But what I'm saying is okay, Gaza right. has. These, the stranglehold around Gaza has not ended. That's exactly what I'm saying, is that well, um, med okay. medical excuse supplies me. and water... Yeah. No, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry there is no logic in it, because uh, everyone uh, knows that when the Gaza Strip was removed, uh, the Olmert government also decided to remove from the West Bank sooner or later. So. Uh, there is no logic in it. And if you see the pictures, for example, there were these greenhouses and uh, American millionaires took, collected a lot of money to save these greenhouses, which were uh, 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 made by the uh, Jewish settlers before, so that the Palestinian people ca can, can do some work in it. And if you see the pictures today, the, these greenhouses, uh, they have glass roofs and uh, in them, you see nothing green, but only big tunnels, 
because this was a very good place to get the weapons out. So this is, this is something, this is something criminal against Palestinian interests. And all, you know, you have to see these kids. 12 years old, there was an opinion poll, 60% of 12-year-old uh, uh, male kids saying, we want to become suicide bombers. And at the same time, 60% of those uh, male kids are bedwetting, which shows how traumatized they are. They're trying to so, score points. So this is very, very, very bad if you try to defend this kind of Palestinian policies to... Continue.